like to say uh, hello and welcome um, to this panel on AI in media. Very excited to have this discussion, which I think is really one of the, the biggest uh, uh, and most crucial topics when it comes to, to talking about AI. And, and today, uh, as you know, we're going to be talking about uh, AI in, in media and news, democracy, and, and the public discourse. And it's a big topic that requires an all-star panel, which I'm pleased to say we have. Um, and, uh, you know, a really wide landscape of, of perspectives from, from journalism, startups, and everything in, in between. So super excited to, to have our panel, which I'll introduce shortly. But first, I'd just briefly like to introduce uh, uh, you to the, the campus. You, you are here at the um, Morantix AI uh, campus. Uh, Morantix, you may know, is an AI investor and uh, venture builder. Uh, we operate the largest AI ecosystem in Europe, the, the beating heart of which you are sitting in right now, the Morantix AI campus. Um, with co-working event space, we, we hold events like this all, all the time, and we just celebrated uh, yesterday our, our uh, third birthday of the campus. So um, yeah, it's been been uh, a great a great place. My, uh, as for my own background, I run communications and PR uh, for Morantix, and before that, I was a, a journalist myself working um, Business Insider, uh, BuzzFeed, The Wall Street Journal, mostly covering the media business. So uh, this is actually a, a topic right at the center of my personal Venn diagram of, of AI and, and media. So um, first, before I introduce the panel, just out of curiosity of the, the sort of audience makeup. So just wondering who, who here is a, a founder of a, of a company or wants to be a founder? Wonderful. Okay. And um, I'm just out of curiosity, are there are, are people working in media or in communications? here okay we've got a nice mix and just working in ai and tech and interested in the in the topic yeah okay and then any investors um who are gonna yeah alessandra back there to invest in <laughs> perfect um okay so so that that's helpful and and maybe you know for for networking purposes afterwards uh, uh you can connect with each other based on based on your your backgrounds and, and interests um but first uh i'd like to just quickly introduce our, our panel before we get into the discussion uh, and we'll we'll have a chat and then obviously open it up uh, to questions at the end. So um, I'll start with uh, the, the end there. That's Till Eckert. Uh, he's an investigative journalist at Correctiv, uh, which you may know the the, the very well known German nonprofit newsroom. Um, he's an expert uh, on the effect of disinformation on democracies. His work is focused on the rise of right wing extremism in Germany, uh, in particular, an investigation looking into how extremists leverage uh, Instagram. Uh, he's reported on uh, Chinese influence at German universities, and he is the recipient of the German Reporter Prize, among other awards. So thank you, Till, for joining us. Um, moving on to uh, Dorothea Gotthardt, who is a former VC investment manager, and uh, she fell in love for the mission of one of her portfolio companies, QuantPi, where she now serves as chief operating officer. Uh, and she guides the operational growth of that company, which is working to build a platform for trustworthy generative AI. And I'll be asking you more about what that entails uh, uh, shortly. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Um, and, and last but not least, we have uh, Maria Amelie, and she's this uh, CEO and co-founder of Factiverse, uh, founded in 2019. It's, um, you were showing us earlier, created a really interesting tool for a credibility check. Uh, of uh, ChatGPT and other um, AI-generated content. Um, it can be used by, by newsrooms, uh, other organizations that publish information um, directly in their content management systems in their CMS. Um, you, you previously worked as a journalist like me, and um, unlike me, you wrote five books uh, uh, on migration, freedom of speech, and entrepreneurship. So thank you. Very, and you're based in Oslo, but joining us here in Berlin this week. So thanks very much for, for joining us. Um, okay, the, uh, I will stop talking pretty soon, um, but let's let's kick it off. Uh, I think um, you know this is obviously a huge year in the in the world. Billions of people around the world are going to be voting. I think it's 50 countries that are voting in 2024. Elections in Indo Indonesia recently, the world's third largest democracy. Um, we have European Parliament elections, UK, and of course uh, the US, where I'm from. In case you couldn't tell, um, and all of this is happening as. AI develops in really exciting ways, but also, um, you know, what we're what we're talking about today is 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 that AI can also be a potent tool for for disinformation. So, um, Till, I wanted to start with you because I know you're passionate about the the, the topic and you're deeply concerned uh, about AI. Um, but before we get into how AI can be used maybe to mitigate some of these threats, could could you talk a little bit about 
um, what you see as, um, yeah, the potential risk in this election year of, of AI. What, what worries you? Um, are, are, are there things that you've seen already, examples that you've seen that, that concern you? And how do you think about this topic um, as someone who is working on the ground every day to combat misinformation? Yeah. Um, I think I would start with what I've seen before the new recent developments of um, machine and deep learning started, um, which was like, um, to be frankly, so terrible. Um, we were working in like, uh, in the fields of disinformation and trying to debunk mis and disinformation for many, many years now. And like even before the recent developments, like the um, effects were pretty harmful to people. Um, for example, during the COVID pandemic, we had many, many people who reached out to us who told us that they not really know what to believe anymore. And that was all before um, the current rise of AI technologies. Um, and now with the rise, we are seeing that um, it speeds up. Um, manipulated content is easier and more effectively to be created. Um, I am concerned that it might be too fast, uh, that we might not be able to tackle it in the future, not effectively. Um, even back then or even now, like once a piece of mis or disinformation is out, um, we can maybe debunk it, but and when it's out, the damage is usually already done. Um, so yeah, that pretty much concerns me. Also, um, what I'm kind of concerned of is like that, again, uh, it's big companies, companies in the US that are leading the way or dictating the way of how this all works out or plays out. We've seen this already with like what I call the failed projects of social media platforms. We see their terrible effects on society. And we also see what happens if like the CEO of like a big social platform changes um, and then this person um, just likes to transform its platform into a platform of where, where it's okay and allowed to spread mis and disinformation. This is the example of Twitter. Um, and yeah, this is something I'm really concerned of. And, and it sounds like, you, are you concerned um, more or, or, or do you think the threat is, is related to things like deep fakes and, and um, what AI might actually be able to achieve from a technological perspective? Or is it more that you're concerned that this actually makes it easier and cheaper to produce, right? Because governments interfering with elections, you know, uh, uh, bad actors trying to interfere with elections, not exactly new. What's new is the, is the technology. So, so where do you really see the biggest threat? Is it a deep fake? Is it, uh, you know, robo, fake robocalls from Joe Biden? Yeah. Uh, the, what, what, what is the, what's do, the issue? I do think that deep fakes are not the biggest problem here. Be deep fakes are the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's something which makes a nice buzzword, but like what really was um, is um, harmful and always was harmful is just like a simple um, picture or a simple colored frame with a sentence written in it and a false sentence claiming um, that a politician said this or that. And Think about it that way. Um, I think before the current um, developments, it was like more a one by one thing. Um, a troll farm, let it be um, of a state, a state affiliated troll farm, let it be in uh, Russia, um, had to create content one by one and then click, put it out into the internet. Now um, they are actually able to um, develop AI agents that are and that are fed by news and then are fed by like current events we see in news and create fakes, fake news, misinformation, disinformation, and then flush it into the internet like 24 seven. And this is something which is already now like possible. This is something we have to deal with already. 
yeah maria what, what do you think about i mean what, um, what can what yeah. can be done <laughs> yeah i can i can add more about the present things uh, with um so nato review i think from march last year they have a good article where they talk about cognitive warfare where basically they're not saying that you know one fake news out there is is cognitive warfare but when you see the campaign uh, of lots of lots of bots and false articles um, and and pictures images over a long time with with a goal to destabilize um, society or a, a certain policy and it can last over a few months or even many many years or decades so that's that's the kind of thing that they're warning um, about um, that is happening uh, which is happening faster now with new developments in AI not because AI is bad but because when AI falls in the bad hands <laughs> wrong hands uh, who misuse that um, already now there are for example um, you have proper chat GPT but you also have uh, dark web uh, GPTs that um, that are used for bad purposes um, so that's that's the kind of development that we are seeing now and and while, while you're chatting about that I think you know I, I gave a very cursory um, explanation of Factiverse and, and your company and um, maybe it would be helpful to just describe a little bit more about what what it is that you do and and what it is you're trying to do um, to to yeah, to make sort of news a little bit, um, yeah, clearer when it comes to, to using uh, AI. So we, we started, uh, my co-founder, he's a professor in machine learning. He started already in 2016 with a research project on how to analyze information and detect uh, sentences that are biased or controversial. Um, and uh, in uh, once we founded the company and launched the product, we what we're doing is that you have, if you provide us with the text, we'll analyze it sentence by sentence and find, um, identify factual statements, um, uh, and then we'll analyze those statements, uh, um, search real time in multiple search engines, and then we'll rank uh, the results based not on like whatever Google is showing you first, but we're showing uh, what uh, what sources that has historically been credible on certain topics. And we're trying to keep our models or the, the, the training data for our models healthy. <laughs> like we, we being mindful of what we put uh, in it because uh, otherwise, like for example, ChatGPT is trained on all kinds of data, but not that I'm comparing ourselves to OpenAI, but we, we do uh, focus on um, articles, um, reliable sources like uh, fact-checking organizations that are certified to be fact-checkers. Uh, and data from reliable, uh, reputable uh, journalists. So we are maybe biased in our own way. Uh, everyone, everyone is, but at least we try to kind of uh, take the most critical uh, readers, uh, journalists, writers, and kind of mimic and show how they are thinking when analyzing information. Yeah, I think that. I mean, we were chatting about this before, and Dorothea, you were saying, um, you know, that's that's something that you think a lot about uh, in your line of work in terms of. Um, bias and and making sure that these systems are, are are not. I mean, but but by the same token, could you maybe describe a little bit about what you do, what Quantpy does, and, and how you think about um, um, yeah this issue of sort of bias in um, you know AI systems. Very happy to. Um, so we built a platform for trust in AI, and we're actually working with people who do not mean harm, but who want to use trustworthy AI. So what we do for them is we have a platform where they can use all kinds of technical tests and qualitative tests to really understand all the risk dimensions of the AI that they are using. So, for example, you have a high critical use case like a recommender system in media. You would like to know are the proper articles presented to the right people? Do I have bias in my recommendation? But also you would like to check do I apply, not apply, comply. Uh, to the re relevant regu regulations. So this all can be done with our platform. Um, but as I said, it's targeted on companies that do actually want to do good. For, so for me, there's for once the harm of people who want to do harm, and then additionally, the inadverted risk that is also there, so double risk. Um, and if I should speak a little bit more about bias, so uh, bias, that's actually what brought me to Quantpy because I think bias is one of the biggest dangers in AI. 
you can't really see it that much. Uh, AI is very convincing. So if we get biased output, it's really difficult to technically test if the AI is biased. Uh, and where does the bias come from? As said, people don't even mean bad. It's a little bit like a child. So you train it on what you say. Uh, and if your parents, your environment is sexist, then the chances that your output is sexist is quite high. And the same goes with AI. And uh, like you said, if we look at the training data that AI is using, uh, I mean, when did women start to vote in France 80 years ago? So what does the data say? What does the AI learn? So that's one of the prog uh, problems that we try to solve with Quantize, so really give insights into, is your AI biased? What's the risk um, for people who mean well? And when this comes to, to sort of media consumption, um, I mean, Maria, you think thinking about this as well. So like the promise of AI in terms of media and entertainment is that it could give you hyper-personalized results or, or hyper-personalized news to yourself. Um, that's actually really compelling, right? I mean, that as a, as a news consumer, um, how do you make sure that that's done in a way that, that doesn't perpetuate biases or, or lead to, you know, even, even starker filter bubbles that, that, that we have now, which I mean, we have a very, fragmented uh, uh, and um, yeah, it's sort of problematic media landscape, but like, do you think that AI and the personalization aspect of it could could help uh, media consumption? Could it exacerbate some of these issues um, about polarization? Like, how are you thinking about this in your own work? I'll throw that out to really anyone. Um, so what we have experienced for the past year is that uh, the search engine uh, results are getting worse. Uh, there's much harder to find credible information, especially public available, good, credible information. And there's a good study from University of Leipzig on exactly that, where they studied the search engines for a full year in 2023. Um, and I think that is a big democratic challenge because then it's making much harder to find information. So. What we, uh, what we do when you want to fact check, for example, that um, uh, something about uh, climate change, uh, we will uh, scour several search engines, but we will, will provide several, we will find the most credible sources um, much faster than actually uh, other search engines. Um, and that, uh, and, but when we had, what we had in the beginning was that we were saying, okay, you're fact-checking something about climate, it's true or false. And then people got really annoyed because they don't want that. They don't want to be clustered. They don't want to have been a filter bubble. Even then when our AI was giving the right answer, they were really annoyed by that. So what people don't want, they don't want to be in a filter bubble. They want to be empowered by technology. They don't want to be controlled by technology. And that's what we also feel with our users who are journalists, analysts, is that they want to uh, feel like they understand complex topics faster and that they see different sides of, of, of a topic. Um, and I think that's where AI solutions can, can help. It's just like this, this huge information overload and they can help them to just navigate in, in, in different, different areas and, ex and explore fa information faster instead of you just getting lots of SEO, SEO content <laughs> in the first search. But this is actually a question that I'm asking myself, not working as a journalist, like this information overflow and AI is getting more and more convincing. I don't have the solution, but how do you fact check all that stuff? Like I couldn't know. You have the output, it's everywhere. And even the, the big media outlets, they must do so much fact checking. Are there any technologies that are used? Um, it frightens me as a consumer. <laughs> Till I mean, you and I have ta talked about this a little bit, but like, you're a journalist. Um, obviously, there are rule, newsrooms have pretty pretty hard rules as to what the reporters can, how they can use like a GPT, how they can use AI. Um, there have been a handful of media scandals that maybe people have seen, like Sports Illustrated had gotten in trouble for uh, fake journalists, and um, there have been a number of these. CNET, we were just talking about, um, ha had this issue as well. Do you see? Um, AI being a reporting tool potentially is it something that could be useful in your in your reporting? Um, is it or is it something that you think will kind of come up against uh, a journalism in a in a more threatening way? In terms of reporting itself, like like um, creating content, I would um, draw a line there. Uh, for me personally. Um, 
I would not let um, a tool write a text for me or, you know, may, or maybe I let, let it help me uh, find a headline or something like that. But I think like nothing that goes beyond that. But um, if I do um, an investigation or research into a topic, there are of course uncertainty tools that are pretty helpful um, that are AI based. Um, I think of geolocation, I think of face recognition, I think of pattern recognition. Um, I think of um, finding similarities in large chunks of documents. Um, that's pretty helpful. Um, this is all pretty labor heavy stuff. It takes forever to do that by hand. Um, so of course this is helpful and I'm happy for that. Um, but yeah, I do think uh, the big question is whether we as media are able to maintain our high standards and transp transparency standards that we have in this new um, developments that are occurring right now. I think like this is the, the biggest question we have to ask ourselves. Like how do we make sure that like our standards are still standing? Um, and how can we uh, assure, uh, like assure the people that we are still quality media and like have credit, offer credible information to the point earlier, um, it just takes a long time to um, get to credible information. This is just a reality of things. Like an investigation like into a topic can take like just very, very long. You have to make a lot of phone calls. You have to do a lot. You have to write a lot of emails. You have to deal with like governmental institutions who are just pretty lazy or taking taking their time to make, not getting back to you. You know, it, it takes a lot of time to to get uh, ahead of things and to to provide the best truth possible. Um, and so we need to st we need to still do that and like so nothing really i think can take this away from us um you know there are maybe maybe uh you can ask like a chat gbt like who do i need to reach out to to um verify this Not information sure. <laughs> okay and then it will have a list okay call this call this call that you know it's like you're saying like until, in, until the robots can call up your sources and get them to tell you things that they are not supposed to, which is basically the core of journalism. Yeah. Uh, you don't feel like your your job is under threat. You feel as though this is a potential tool that can help you, um, yeah, research topics more easily, but that ultimately you're concerned that the, the cons outweigh the, the pros. Is that what I'm picking up from your deep sigh that you just made? Nah, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I, I don't know. I do not. I, 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 maybe I'm cautiously optimistic that this may, uh, this may even like um, make news and media and trustful media more important again. I think so. Like when I when I yeah, thought about this panel, I'm very convinced of that because this overflow of communication. Uh, I read a, a newsletter yesterday that uh, referred to AI as weapons of mass production of content because you just have information everywhere. You can't verify it. I'm frankly tired. Like I I don't want to just consume any information that is out there because knowing about the biases and the hallucinations and everything of AI, I don't trust it. So if I have a media institution, a media organization that I feel like I can trust where I saw you did your fact checks, you can be trusted. I think it's a very, very big chance for traditional journalism to actually yeah, get to the forefront of being information providers again after all the social media. Hopefully. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, and I think it obviously comes at a time when like media business models are extremely challenged right now, and um, uh, you know the, the the advertising market has has been tough. The subscription market, which exploded in the last few years, um, you know people maybe have a little subscription fatigue. So, um, do do you think that in this yeah in the in this environment where yeah there's so much content and really good prized trustworthy media is I mean does that create greater value in a way that makes that makes you optimistic about the future of the of the news business or um yeah, yeah. i'm i'm optimistic when it comes to local journalism um there they started uh, a lot of the local newspapers started using ai tools maybe not for writing uh, which i agree is, is very personal uh, to write a, a text um but for for some you know tedious manual tasks because there, there are a lot of them as well when you're a journalist and uh, I think local journalism is one of the main one of the pillars of democracy because they are on the ground they're following things that are being reported afterwards in the national newspapers 
So them employing more of the AI tools when they're understaffed and um, it, yeah, it, it, it definitely helps, uh, helps a lot. Everything from like text, some text summarization, uh, analysis of a lot of uh, articles or, or like doc, doc PDF documents or um, following, you know, what are the expenses of the local politicians on where are they investing, where they have ownership, all of these things. It's kind of AI, maybe some more like advanced Excel or machine learning, um, but, but it, it does help a lot. Yeah, that's interesting. I want to, um, because this is a panel about AI and media, um, I want to just pivot a little bit and talk a little bit about um, how AI is covered in, in the media. Um, it's something obviously that all of us are reading about a lot. There's been a media feeding frenzy uh, in the past two years about the topic. And I'm curious what you all think about from your different vantage points of like, is, is AI being covered by the media um, responsibly? Like, is there, is there fear mongering? Is it actually not strong enough? Um, how would you characterize like the, um, yeah, the, the coverage of, and then the, the public perception of, of AI, like how do, do people know enough? Like what? Yeah. So I'm just curious from your different perspectives, how you think about when you read articles about AI, like what, what strikes you? Um, so as a non-journalist, not from media, for me, um, it's very dystopian. And uh, I love gloomy dystopian fiction, but it's not fiction. It should be news. And I think the danger is if the articles we are reading are all about AI is taking over and the next elections will be only run by robots and uh, all those things, then the gap between reality and what we can actually prevent now and this fiction is too big and then people don't project themselves in the risks. So it's always yeah, a little bit too science fiction-y, dystopian for me. I think if we would actually start speaking about the things that are happening now, and a shit ton of things are happening now, um, then it would be easier for people to understand what is actually happening, how can we pre prevent that. Um, so that would be my uh, part, but maybe that's my filter bubble also. Uh, no, no, I, I, I agree. I agree it's the same. It's, it's pretty dystopian, and then it's not a lot of focus on um, that in real life things actually take time, for example, to implement AI uh, in companies, in industries, that's that's taking time. <laughs> you, can, you know, they're just now sitting together and getting their AI strategy and, and then next year they, they're going to collect all the data they need and that's going to take maybe a couple of years. So like things take time. Um, but but what I'm, what I think the national press is not covering enough maybe for me is the dangers of using some of these tools like LLMs and the bias that is inherently in there and how to treat, um, like some journalists we've interviewed, they're treating ChatGPT as a source, as any source, and they are like thinking what, they get a text from ChatGPT and then they're thinking, what is your agenda? Um, like they, when they're interviewing a person. So like being more critical <laughs> when people, because there are, there are so many people that are just using ChatGPT uncritically. Till, what do you think? Can you you want to defend the media and its coverage nope. of AI? There has been some great coverage, of course. Um, there has been some uh, some good deep reporting from, for example, the colleagues at Lighthouse Reports in um, the Netherlands. They reported on bias. Mm -hmm. They reported on bias. I think, like in the in the Dutch version of the Arbeidsamt, <laughs> you know, yeah. don't know the word. Uh, but. Um, aside from that, I agree. I think like most of the reporting we see um, is pretty alarmistic. I'm not a fan of that. Um, I do think good reporting needs to be specific, um, and um, it's it's it doesn't help no one to just uh, doom uh, the people out. It's it's kind of um, yeah, it's not beneficial. So. But what I do think still is like I I I, I miss I miss um, I think like a more grounded a more grounded reporting on the subject um, a reporting that is not based on buzzwords such as deep fake and deep fake. So, I mean, you may get get your wish this year as I think the stuff becomes less yeah permeates society more. People see more examples of what you're talking about. Um, they interact more with AI in their own lives and careers. And so, um, you, you know, things may get a little bit more um, literal. But I, I think 
you know, one thing that we, we, we haven't really talked about yet is um, actually how a lot of this misinformation and, and, and all of this is distributed. Um, we've talked about its creation, but not its distribution. And of course, all of that pretty much is happening on social media. Um, what, what sort of responsibility do social media platforms have here for policing this content? Um, how can they do it? Um, w w w you know, it's a big, it's a big topic, obviously. Um, but you know, what, what are you, um, if you could take over, uh, uh, X today, what Yo. would you do till? Dude, like if they, <laughs> if the social media platforms were, were to be happen to be willing to limit the spread of disinformation, misinformation, they would have already done it. Because they don't want to, because they want our, our, our eyeballs and, and ad dollars. They want our money. So um, those are companies and like the algorithm is as sacred as if you ask Coca-Cola for the recipe. And um, nobody else can like, you know, come, come from the outside and intrude that and question and ask it. I know that for a fact because I had like multiple background checks, uh, chats with people from Facebook. And um, if I asked specific question about um, the usage of algorithm and made proposals and maybe made it more safe, they just like were throwing some weird blubber marketing sentences at me and then it was like sorry did you understand my question i did it again and then it was again the same uh, the same blubberish marketing stuff that i um heard so it's it's kind of you know they they have the, they have everything they need to limit um the spread of misinformation so then what is, what is it going to take is it going to take scrutiny from reporting you know reporters like you is it going to take uh, regulation. regulation hard regulation okay so what does that what does that look like to, to have, and and what do you all think about um, the sort of government responsibility? Obviously, we have the EU AI Act now here in in Europe. But what do you think uh, responsible AI regulation when it comes to policing disinformation and and policing social media platforms? What does that look like? Yeah, it's a it's a bit scary. It's a slippery slope because then you close to like freedom of speech and in US like First Amendment. So there, there is some, there are some interesting discussions on that in in US now, where Texas, I think, proposed their own uh, rules to to for content moderation on on big platforms. Um, so I think when it comes closer to topics of freedom of speech, often what is in this constitution is still the best the best thing we can we have when it comes to regulation. Um, and then the other thing which. Um, uh, Francis Fukuyama, he wrote, he writes about that, where he says that the most important thing in this phase we're now is the diversity of different options so that you have not just one platform that says this is biased, this is not biased, or this is true or false, but you have actually multiple platforms and the diversity of that so that people can 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 access and have 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 diversity of opinions. Um, but it, but it is. It is. I mean, the, I think the what's happening within EU is going to be very interesting uh, to follow, um, but it's going to be, I think, tough for smaller companies because uh, it's a lot more bureaucracy and a lot more paperwork. So everyone has to also keep up um, with that. Um, I'm I'm trying to just you know learn everything that's just happening with all the new regulations. Um, yeah. It's tough. <laughs> and it's like even if you want to, it's just technically complex yeah. to test the AI systems. Um, so I think the problem with the regulation is I don't want to go too much into the European AI Act. I think it has been spoken about sufficiently, yes. uh, and most You're people on are very tired. I'm also. Uh, I just want to say I don't. I, I do think there's because you asked there's of course responsibility by governments to regulate this, but especially as with the media. From how I understood the European AI Act media is not covered like uh, what what do they say about media nothing like it's not even in the proper risk categorization so it's very gray zone -y. so for me for all those specific industries there should be well industry bodies I mean we have the um now I forgot the name that's embarrassing the um, <laughs> the financial institution in Germany the BaFin for example those institutions they for me are um, the people responsible for regulating in industries because they know how the industry works and media you have all those topics about freedom of speech which is which is very industry specific so how can the European Parliament regulate that it's impossible so I would see it with uh, I don't know what is media 
um, in Germany. But I would see those people to regulate it and not too much. Uh, regulation can be very harmful, but I would certainly expect certain uh, transparency obligations because I want to understand where the media I'm consuming is coming from. Um, so just that, but not going too deep. Sorry, that was around about regulation. Sebastian did a great job with the uh, wire card thing. <laughs> just till I, I, I didn't want to praise the Bafin. Till ready to, to put his trust in Bafin. I behave myself. Yeah. No. Um. No. We're on the record take, till it's. Uh, take, you know. You can say. Just take take money from these platforms. Mm -hmm. Give it. Give it to to law enforcement and train train law enforcement. Make them pay. Simple as that. We cannot. We we need to stop to pretend and those are 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 not public spaces just because you have to to click on um, an AGB thing, yeah, click, yeah. And you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's open space, it's the internet. And so I think like we need to take them, you know, we need to make, make them accountable. Make the platforms more, yeah. more accountable, yeah. Yeah, it's because you also have, like you have so many investors and it's just so much money that. Um, Why are they not paying taxes? Yeah, yeah exactly. Why? This is the only way in in uh, in how you can like hold companies accountable why are they not paying taxes just make them pay and also why are they not paying for like i don't know like data like like one one megabit um of personal data they grab from us we are the product why are we not make them pay but we are also the people aside from regulation who can hold them accountable so i think uh, we are speaking about regulation but i do think there's i i don't think that the social media platforms are super responsible or anything and definitely not proactive in being responsible. But I would say I do at least see a little shift into responsible AI. I might be greenwashing, um, but they are doing something. And why are they doing it? Certainly not because of regulation, because it's not there for media as far as I understood. So I think it's because of this push by the consumers that they want trustworthy AI. So for me, that would be the other option next to just trusting on the governments and the barfins of this world again, um, but actually speak up more. Um, yeah. Well, but I do want to open it up to, to questions, and, but I, before I do, I, in the spirit of um, the Morantics AI campus and collaboration and a sort of more positive note, I, I'm curious, you know, what, I think Factiverse is a good example of a, of a collaboration between um, yeah, but, but between sort of using AI and and um, and media, and I mean, how do you think media companies, startups, policymakers, acad academics, how can we kind of work work together on, on these issues? Um, how can we figure out a way to tackle this really these really big problems that we're talking about today in, in a way that yeah that that aligns uh, together on the societal values that I think everybody seems to share? Um, so I mean, how are, how are you thinking about? about that, what, 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 what can we do? Just immediately what I thought is uh, actually the EU funding has been very helpful. Um, one is the, the, the grant, the ESA grant uh, that kind of helps you to get um, institutional money uh, and not just uh, investors, um, typical like in VC investors that have kind of, that's money with, that has more long-term, you can plan more long-term, there's, uh, you can experiment more. You can uh, um, have better values as well as if you would get institutional, like VC investor, that it will just, you know, crush you. Um, <laughs> not not everyone, but there are there are some, right? And then the other, like we we are, we are now part of the Nordis, which is a EU funded Nordic fact checking um, consortium, uh, uh, where we are in as a technology partner, and that. That that's for us. It's amazing because we can we can learn a lot from from the fact checking organizations, but we can also develop something that that would be very helpful for them, and that is happening because of the some of the EU funding that is coming in and enabling kind of these meeting places with academia and tech and also media. Funding is great, and I was an investor before, but I think more important is actually customers and i don't know uh, about the founders here but also when we were still investing it was always like okay b2c it's okay b2b is tougher b2 enterprise is really tough and b2g forget it so for me that would be a part where 
governments can actually help startups, especially in those societally important things where it might be difficult to crack those enterprises that are a little bit hesitant to invest their money into, for example, responsible AI. If we would have more governmental bodies who are actually our users or try the solution or want to give feedback, that at least uh, from our perspective would help a lot. But hell no, we, well, we would sell to B2Government, but it's very difficult. Uh, it's the worst sales cycle I think we can have. Um, it, I'm not speaking about journalism, sorry, I don't know uh, enough about that, but just speaking about pushing those important topics between governments and startups. Uh, yeah, please. <laughs> Till, what do you think? What do you? <laughs> you're just gonna keep doing your, doing your stories. You don't need us. No, I think like uh, funding is crucial in um, stuff like AI safety. Um, I think like this should be like um, um, uh, researched more, and I think like this is gonna be very crucial for the future. Um, I also do believe um, that we need to teach the people. Um, literacy is a big topic, um, could be large campaigns, and for God's sake, just finally do a school class, like, about media and internet, like, we don't, it's a media it's literacy, 2024. Yeah, yeah, media literacy, we don't have it, it's 2024, I'm, we have those in Norway, you do have, yeah, yeah because we're, Norway, learn. we're German, yeah. they definitely don't have them <laughs> yeah, in the US, yeah, it's, they it's, just put on Fox News for, yeah, like, 35 minutes, yes. Have at it. Tucker Carlson doing it. Here's your gun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. That's not how it is. <laughs> this is how like an Einkaufswagen is working. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. And also, I think like, yeah, the responsibility of the media is also there. I think like we need to um, hold companies accountable. We need to hold governments accountable. This is, I think, like my job and I am trying to do it. So, yeah. And what do you think? Oh, um, with that, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, no, I think, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree. I think the media literacy class is like, should be absolutely mandatory and like, certainly in, in this country and where I'm from as well. I mean, I think that's, that's, that is the, I think the single biggest problem, um, is, and also I think when you talk to people, people just, media is a complete black box. Nobody understands how, how things get made, how stories get made how the news is is produced and there's just like no there's like no trust i mean i really what this comes down to is just a lack of trust i don't know how we um tackle that problem i'd like to think that ai can be a tool for for good and i i like kind of what i'm hearing that um that you think that ultimately the ai has the potential to raise the like monetary value of good journalism because i i also am worried about um yeah, good media companies going under because the business model is challenged. So um, I'm I, I'm cautiously optimistic as well. But um, with that, uh, I'd like to open it up to to any questions, and I can just sort of bring the mic. Is that how we do it here? I bring the mic. All right, great. Maybe just like introduce yourself and. First of all, thank you all. It was very interesting. Uh, my name is Andrea Nepri. I'm also a journalist. I work for La Repubblica in Italy. I've worked for Deutsche Welle in the past. I know full well how bad the situation for journalism is. As you mentioned, the business model is absolutely not working anymore. The people that run journalism, I'm guess talking for big journalistic companies, absolutely don't understand anything about these topics and they need to take the decisions. And the reason why you only read stuff about dystopian future is because they, they see a thing, you know, spitting out an entire paragraph and they think it's magic. So that's the kind of line they need to go for. But apart from that, regulation, Section 230 is the only regulation you get in America, and it's in favor of these companies. They are not editorial companies. But my question was more toward Morantics, because we're talk, talking about this a lot. I was checking in what kind of businesses or, or you know, sectors you invest. And I've seen cybersecurity, I've seen healthcare, I've seen a lot. I haven't seen media. <laughs> so th there must be a reason why you don't think <laughs> there's a good return in investing a lot of money in media AI startups. So we need money <laughs> and we can't make it anymore. So uh, why? No, I, 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 I mean, I didn't realize I was gonna be put on the spot as the PR guy here. Um, no, but I, I com no, completely agree, right? And it's like a tough, um, and we were talking about this too because your customers are 
you know, our, our media businesses, so, some of your customers are potentially media businesses and you're asking, journal, yeah, journal, and it's like, it's, 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 it's tough, right? Because of the business model is so challenged. However, I will say that we have at Morantix a current founder in residence who's sitting behind you, Elon, who is ideating on these very topics and working on, on, on a potential case, uh, a few potential cases that involve um, you know, how, how, yeah, how basically, yeah, start up in this sort of authentication space to help, help media companies uh, in this regard. But I mean, I think, I think you're right. Like we are investors and you're looking at use cases and okay, is it like, is this a good bit? You know, it's, 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 it's tough. Um, but uh, there are a handful of really interesting, I think, media startups that are, um, are working on these challenges including Maria's. So um, they have, these are getting investment and I think it's super important. And I think investors should, um, yeah, should look more into these, into these companies like Morantix is currently doing. Same. Um, yeah, and also as, as media startup, we, we've, we work toward, we have to, when we talk to investors, we have to kind of explain that it's not just gonna be media, it's gonna be like financial sector. Uh, and then they're like, okay. <laughs> That's that's interesting. Like that that you have several um, um, silos you're gonna be working, uh, kind of makes the investment easier. <laughs> but but it is it, it is tough to raise funding as a as a as a media startup. Any other questions? Maybe preferably one not for me. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Um, hi, uh, I'm I'm Nicole. Oops, you got it. I'm spilling drinks. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm, I'm also a journalist. Um, I actually sold my media company over COVID. I was like, oh, you want money for that? Okay. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry. It was, I was really surprised. Um, they didn't shut it down, right? Cause, and I sold it because I knew, because I was having trouble holding the line, right? I couldn't, I couldn't make enough money because I couldn't hold the line of journalistic integrity, right? So now I freelance for Bloomberg because they have a very strong journalistic line and I needed to feel that to stay in the industry. Right, and so like I've embraced AI tools heavily into my workload, right? Because you have to, right? It's either like you evolve or you find another career. <laughs> and so one of the things that I struggle with um, to stay in journalism is the fact that as we look at AI today, right? It's like the evolution of the internet. Like when we first had the internet and then we have this aha moment and all these, you know, everything sort of changes, right? But the internet was made by Stanford and AI is made by businesses, right? And businesses currently have a higher trustworthiness score than media does. <laughs> and this is terrifying to me, right? So as we move forward, the fact that AI is driven by business, right? And, and, and potentially bought, right? How do you see the future of media moving forward with the fact that this new tool isn't you know, from Stanford and will be given freely and openly, but is based around bottom lines. And the fact that businesses are considered to be more trustworthy than media, which is so sad. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Our panel says no. Terrifying. Um, also, no, but I feel you um, deeply on like the integrity part. And like, you know, you try to, you, we've all, started to do this because we are we have the strong sense of integrity and yeah it's kind of hard to maintain it while you get bombarded from left and right with everything um but to your question uh tough one uh very tough one don't think i have any there is an easy answer now like um talked about business models a little bit um i think what you said earlier about like the paywalls like i thought about like paywalls and that they are actually now turning to be a big problem. Because like when we hide like credible news behind paywalls, that's yeah. the, you know, it like becomes just for the rich basically. You know, like only paper people paper. who are economically like able uh, to get credible information are, are getting it. it's a problem. So get rid of that, but then where's the money? Uh, tough. Yeah, but then also sometimes the media is kind of making things worse by having by doing this like paid ad content, paid art, paid articles that you a business is is paying for an article 
th that looks like an article, but it's not editorially integrity have editorial integrity, and then readers also get confused. So it's it's a it's it's a very challenging um, field. So maybe I, I would actually encourage some media to stop doing that because I was doing those articles as well when I was a journalist and. And when I work started working with the misinformation, I just realized, oh, it's like I, I am actually creating some kind of light misinformation uh, content because it's not editorially um, corrected in in any way. It's just like advertising. But um, um, I'm also when you started thinking talking about internet, I'm I started like and who owns? Isn't internet today like owned also by businesses? Like a lot of the internet. Um, yeah. can to some extent test the AI that you are using. So it's just the responsibility that moves to the consumer or the company that is using it. And uh, maybe to spread some optimism, um, I was a few years ago really surprised that the, I think the, one of the first companies that had ethical AI guidelines was Bayerischer Rundfunk globally. And I mean, that in media, like uh, I would have thought maybe healthcare or finance or I don't know, but they were one of the first. And if they then really start to might be, I don't know what they are doing behind it, but if they really start to reinforce that work on that, like you can test the AI, but it's just, yes, we all have responsibility to do it, um, but it's not a lost game, I would say, at least. Also, um, coming from Corrective, which is a nonprofit, um, maybe strengthen the nonprofit sector as like a third, um, we, like here in Germany, we have like the private sector, we have like the open sector uh, with BR. Uh, for example, um, and then uh, smaller newsroom like us, like, but who are not, um, we are until now not, um, what's the word in English? We're not gemeinnützig. Um, yeah, so we cannot, we, we, the only way we are allowed to ask people for like um, private, private funding is like because we have like an educational um, foot as well. So media itself cannot be like, um, it's not um, obligated to, to, to ask money as, as funding like, like a Verein like could do. So this in Germany, for example, we, need to, we could strengthen that. There are many people working on that, including our founder. Um, but this could be, um, could be a, a potential optimistic thing in the future too, because like then it would be people funded and not um, advertising funded or, or state funded. Yeah, I thought your point about the paywall thing was really interesting. And I think one thing that we didn't really talk about yet was like how these um, large language models, like what content they're scraping. And um, there's obviously a huge fight between media companies and like the New York Times and OpenAI in, in court over that content. So if you've got really good high quality content behind the paywall that is not allowed to be uh, a part of the model, like then you're not feeding the model with good informa good information, right? So then it becomes even more siloed. Um, so it's just it's something that obviously will play out in court probably over the next few years as to as to how that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Kyle, and I came into the media space by being a strategist and investor at Axel Springer. Um, unfortunately, in my role, we were actually diversifying a lot away from media investments and into other fields to basically make media more sustainable, kind of by a subsidization type <laughs> strategy. Um, yeah, a couple thoughts here. I guess the first thing I was I had in my head was just thinking about how with ChatGPT, you don't have sources, right? And I think, unfortunately, it's making the public more and more sort of reliant to just accept what's there and not what you're taught as like a university student of, wow, we need to rely on the source. But a second thing was we've touched on was how um, we identify fake news. 
And I think this is just like a huge kind of question mark out there of we need to be able to identify it in order to stop its spread. And I read something last year that said fake news spread six times faster than factual news, which is kind of freaky when you think about that. Um, so my question is, I know you guys kind of work in this space, but do you think also with your journalistic backgrounds that, and that we could identify algorithmically if a sentence is false or true? Or is that something that we can only really rely on a journalist to do? I mean, it's a little bit what we're doing, yeah. Uh, we identify a statement and then we check that statement and we can say, okay, this statement have historically been, been uh, uh, true or false or like uh, disputed or supported uh, by these sources. So, and we also in ChatGPT, so if you use our plugin there, you can, you can get more sources than the ChatGPT is giving you. So you can, if you want to fact check something, a text GPT created for you, you can, you get a bunch of sources from five different search engines and databases um, instead of just getting something from Bing. Um, so like that's, that's the, uh, uh, and we do train our model on fact checks. So it's, it's not just any, anything that is uh, online. Um, and one thing uh, we haven't discussed a lot when it comes to AI is explainable AI. I think it's going to be very, very important, and that's going to—that's kind of part of trust, trustworthy as well, AI as well. Because what we learned from our users is that they say, "Oh, you have fact-checked this sentence. Great, but I don't trust you. <laughs> Why do you say that this this um, that uh, the statement about climate change is supported and disputed by these sources?" But if we can show what is happening in the black box of AI, we can say, okay, our model run run uh, through this uh, through through this all this stuff, all this data, and actually uh, we see that when we answered on this question, we didn't have enough data, so we just gave you whatever the first answer we came up with. So I think like this kind of ex explainable AI, um, where you can see why the algorithm is why AI is giving you that answer is going to be pretty crucial as well for, for just analyzing, not just saying like what is so what is support, supported or disputed, but also so that you can tr understand the output. Maybe not necessarily still trust it, but you can understand the reasoning behind the AI. Sorry, that was a longer answer. But... I very much hope so. That's what we do. <laughs> so, um, but just to answer your question, I know that in the very first, um, in the very first models, the output could be checked, but it's getting more and more difficult. Like if you don't have, like if you have the input and then the output, then it's very easy to check if it's generated by a machine. But right now, as AI is what well, developing hyper fast, I think it's getting more and more difficult. With the first GPT models, even our algorithms could spot uh, those things. You know, it's getting uh, very, very difficult. Uh, maybe just to again put a little bit of a positive light on this, the companies can actually manage that, the companies distributing the LLM. So I don't know if you heard about this new open AI thingy, the voice engine that they uh, now privately, no, not privately, but they developed and in 15 seconds it can clone a voice, like completely. And here they have blocked it from the public, yay, finally. Uh, and they, they are thinking about watermarking it. Uh, watermarking, is that the word? So uh, like, then again, you need to trust the companies that are building those solutions to actually do it. But if we could enforce that certain generic output must be watermarked, as is for example, also now with chatbots in the European AI Act, you must say you are communicating to an AI. So of course there will be people who do not do that, uh, like the people who want to do bad, but it could help a little bit to spread some optimism. There are also people working on that. Um, one thing I should have disclaimed probably way earlier is that, that we are also working with Facebook. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, like in our fact checking, in our fact checking program, uh, we are also like um, given access to a tool provided by Facebook to be able to scan um, Facebook um, on potentially on potential mis and disinformation or content, um, and they also 
paying us like a certain amount of money if we decide to write a fact check and then like link the fact check to a piece of content on Facebook. So this is something Corrective is already doing. You should have disclosed this earlier. Um, but so this is kind of like a part of the answer, right? They are already like training, training the system, like they are training it for many years um, to find like patterns. And um, I do also know that like a, um, a team of like independent uh, researchers in Germany are currently um, researching and developing a um, solution which um, could also um, see on pieces of content, like whether this may be uh, a mis or disinformation. It's not like a proper pre-bunk, it's not like a proper, you know, like they, they not go in and say like, this is false because of this and that, but they say like the way um, the piece of content is arranged could, it, this could be a piece of disinformation. They want to offer this to, I think like dark social channels like Telegram um, and Signal and stuff like that. So there is actually stuff going on in this direction. And maybe it's just a matter of time um, until we see something like this actually being in place and applied. I think just to add, it is sometimes in place, but it's a little bit with like uh, encryption, right? Like if the technology changes, then you have to adapt oh. again. And as soon, like as quickly as AI is changing, it's very difficult for the encryptors to adapt to the new technology when it's already at the next step. But I also. Hi, yeah, my name is Julia. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say um, that uh, don't be so harsh with uh, teachers. Uh, so I have uh, children in elementary and middle school and they do receive a lot of media literacy training at all uh, grades and uh, I think it's great. It's just, of course, always uh, depends on the, um, on, on the sources they use, but I, there's a lot of material out there and the teachers, are, at least at the schools that I know in the US and in Germany, they use them. Uh, so this is a anecdotal, of course, it's not, I, I can't uh, talk for all, uh, all schools, but I just wanted to say that we can't always just say, well, this has to be taught in school. Um, and uh, no, but actually my, my other, my, my question was um, about, um, yeah, media actually being companies, we've talked about this a lot, and I think we shouldn't uh, forget that uh, newspapers have always been businesses and that you know we have uh, we we have uh, people like Murdoch or Hearst in the past and uh, Borda and I mean they're they're billionaires and how did they become so because they had companies uh, who produce news uh, and and spread them and uh, so this isn't linked to technology as such or at least not modern technology it's always been the uh, the business model for me for most media, uh, maybe with the slight exception of uh, öffentlich rechtlicher Rundfunk, uh, or in the U.S. donation based uh, public radio, which is a great thing too. But it depends on the donors, of course, which way they want to head. So I wanted to know what you think of models like um, Axel Springer partnering with OpenAI in order to um, have some grasp on what. ChatGPT spreads as news. Uh, it's of course something that only a big company like Axel Springer can do, uh, but it's the first company to do so, media company to do so. And I think it's interesting to see the results of that. And I recently talked to a person there uh, who, who works in that department there and I asked naively, well, can't you spread that as some kind of a template to others? And of course, there is a is a clear line. But I mean, is that a model that you, where you think there is something to be learned of, or maybe copied from? Yeah. For example, uh, Mistral. Um, I don't know if you've seen that they have a really nice business plan that is on Sifted, um, where they they say that they're going to be licensing uh, content from from me, from the media and paying for that. And uh, it seems like European AI companies are maybe more focused uh, on that, not just like, and, and we, we as well kind of, we plan that we will be licensing content uh, at some point. We can't just grab it, whatever is out there. 
Um, I don't know what you guys think. I think it's a great idea. I mean, if you have verified content, then the then the then the AI can't do that much damage. The problem is again then who's paying in the end because uh, yeah, that's still there. It's uh, the paywall limit. So then you have the verified information that you need to get through OpenAI and Axel Springer. Um, I don't know if it solves that problem, but I think, uh, I mean, a little bit like your solution is you check verified uh, sources to see whether it's right or wrong. Um, so in itself, of course, you, should, you could commercialize um, more or less verified <laughs> news outlets information. I mean, I think it's also like media companies got totally burned in the social media wave by giving away their content for free. And Springer, I think, is like, well, we're in a position now to get a deal for our content, and I'm not sure we're going to be able to get the same deal in five years. Um, so they're probably, I mean, I, I don't have any inside info, but I think that that's, uh, whereas like the New York Times taking like a, a different tack and being more, more aggressive and, and suing and probably betting that that will go I mean, it probably will go to the U.S. Supreme Court um, and, and be a really interesting, interesting case. But I think like now, what you see is Facebook and Google and all these companies paying news publishers, like Corrective, um, as kind of like. And I, I think I can say this is the PR guy. Like it's, I mean, you know, it is PR, right? I mean, it's like they got like uh, or like you know, journalism, um, the Facebook Journalism Institute. You know, it's like. The, it was sort of apology money for totally ruining the industry, um, or not ruining the industry, but 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 destroying the business model. Um, and so I think it's probably a good thing that like OpenAI and and frankly all these media companies are like, okay, let's let let let's have a moment where we come together and figure out like the value exchange now because if we don't, this is going to be even like a like a bigger problem. So um, yeah, I think well, we'll see, but I I think. Probably smart move by by Springer. Certainly smart move by OpenAI. Anyway, um, on that note, um, uh, thank you, thank you all for for coming and your great questions, and thank you so much to our to our panel. Um, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and um, yeah, please um, stick around and and have a have a beer, have a, a snack, and um, yeah, thanks. Uh, ch ch check the uh, AI Campus website for more upcoming events. Uh, um, so yeah, thank you all very much for coming.